Right, so I'm going to outline. Uh, right, so I'm going to provide a, a basic introduction to Splunk and machine learning. So in the next part, we'll look in more detail at machine learning and some of the methods. For uh, this part, we'll just look at some of the ways that we fit models to our data. Okay, so basic introduction to machine learning and we'll look at the machine learning models that uh, that Splunk supports. So often we differentiate in cybersecurity the different types of approaches as in signature detection and that's where we have a well-defined uh, signature or behavior and we try to match uh, uh, to this or where we have anomaly detection where we define a standard uh, behavior, the normal or normality, and then anything that moves away from this normality is defined as an anomaly. And then within this, we have the concept of a true positive, and that's where we've uh, actually managed to identify something correctly, or a false positive, where we trigger an alert and it's actually a false alert. So the basic steps that we have is that we have to define the information sources that will come in from logs uh, and uh, many other places and bring them in together into a single source. Then we define our data capturing tools that we, we might have to be able to make sure that we capture the correct uh, data. Then we process that data to make it ready for our analysis uh, tool. And then we might extract some key features from the data uh, to make the model less complex and more focused. Then we have our analysis engine, which will take the data and uh, our machine learning model, and then finally to make a decision on that, on the data. Okay, so uh, we'll uh, have a quick look at uh, some uh, examples of fitting a model in, within machine learning in this part, and then the next part we'll look in more detail at uh, at how we can score those models. So the basic commands that we have within Side Splunk are fit to, to fit a model, apply will save the model that we have that we could be used later on. A summary will show us the basic details of the model that we've applied. List models will show us all the models we have in our system. A delete model deletes uh, a, a model and then score gives us the basic scoring that we have for that model. So let's have a quick look at uh, an example uh, here. Okay, so uh, we're reading in this data set here. So uh, within Splunk, we can uh, read in our data set in the form of uh, uh, CSV file. And you can see here that uh, we have petal length, petal width, sepal length, sepal width, species is in our data set. We can then apply a machine learning model onto this. In this case, it's Gaussian NB. We're training for petal length, and then we're using a certain parameter. So let's say we use a petal width to train, and a sepal width. Okay, then we, we define this as our new model. And in Splunk, it's case sensitive, so just watch that. And then we're going to save that as, as my model. So we'll just run that and see what we get. OK, so this is uh, taking, uh, this is trying to predict for the petal length using petal width and sepal width here, and then storing it in my model. Just takes a little minute to run it. Okay, so there's the prediction here uh, for uh, petal length, 1.2. There's 1.4, that's 1.4, that's 1.2 there. Okay, so we can now uh, have a look at uh, that model. So there, and then it's summary, my model. Okay, so in this case, we can re recall it back using the summary command. And there's the model there that we saved. 
and we can also list our models. There they are there. And we'll just see if we can find our model. That is there. That's the model that we've just created. And we can see there's the type there, who the owner is, and so on. Okay, and there's the details of our model in there. And we can recall it if we need to. Okay, so we'll come back on to the scoring uh, uh, later on. Uh, but that's obviously important to be able to assess the different types of models that we have. Okay, but for just now we have our input lookup command, we then apply model and we, 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 we fit a model and then we, up, we can apply it. So we'll look at the various models that we have with inside Splunk and uh, uh, we'll just uh, apply them and have a look to see their output. Later on in the next part we'll actually We'll drill in a bit more detail about well, what model's the best. Okay, so these are the ones that we have. We have outliers and anomalies. We can have a category. A category is typically, say, as a string uh, value uh, where we would uh, categorize within uh, a certain uh, finite set. And numeric values can obviously be integer or, or real uh, values. Uh, so with outliers for numeric, we have standard deviation into quartiles and medium absolute deviation. And then for categories, we can have anomaly detection, local outlier factor, and one class SVN. We can predict our values. We can take a value and then we can predict what the, that the, a field is with uh, certain uh, uh, fields as an input. We can either do that for numeric prediction, typically using a regression method, such as linear regression, or we could do it with a category, such as logistic regression, SVM, and, and so on. Then we'd, sometimes we need to prepare our data. So what we might do is we might have a lot of, uh, of uh, features, maybe 20, and that's too complex for our model, so we could reduce it down into two or three. For that, we can have field selection to pick the best fields, or we could have what's called PCA or TFIDF, where we can reduce down the complexity to a fewer number of uh, features. We might also pre-process our data. So we might take uh, large values uh, and reduce them down into a standard uh, value, because what we won't want is large values to be able to swamp smaller uh, values. So normally what we would do is to normalize our values down between 0 and 1 or minus 1 and plus 1. Then we can also group. Some applications require us to cluster. So it might be uh, for malware. It'd be malicious malware, uh, non-malicious, and then uh, suspected maliciousness. We could cluster within those three uh, cluster groups. And then finally, we often have to look at time forecasting. How many logins will there be at 9 o'clock tomorrow and at 10 o'clock? Can we forecast that based on what we've seen in the past? Okay, so we're going to have a look at each of these areas uh, for the simply the fitting of the model and, and not much else. So the first one we'll look at is in outliers, either with category or numeric values. So in this case, we'll start with local outlier factor. So we're going to predict the petal width uh, and uh, the, the petal length and the petal width uh, based on uh, certain parameters. So we'll just get that opened up. Okay, so here we are. Okay, so we're going to try to find anomalies for petal length and petal width. Okay, so then what we get here is a score, whether it's an outlier 
or not, and then an anomaly score. Okay, so we can see here the anomalies will vary from 1 uh, to, to minus 1 in there, and then the results on anomaly score that, that we get. Okay, so in this way uh, we can actually uh, uh, define if something is an outlier or not based on certain parameters that we're, we're selecting. So if we go back and try the next one, and what you'll find is that uh, these methods are based on the Python sklearn uh, library, and if you're looking for the documentation, you'll find it in the sklearn uh, documentation online. So we'll try the one class uh, SVM, here and we'll see what we get okay we'll run that okay it's one class SVM so in this case we're looking at all of the parameters and not just the individual ones so we'll just run that to see what we get so there are various parameters that we can use for this and uh, we just need to run it and there we are there so is normal or is not normal so this gives us our measurement uh, here for the one class uh, SVM okay so it's, uh, with this we can actually define whether we have an anomaly or not you can see here already that uh, the petal width looks uh, rather strange the anomalies and here is a more normal uh, petal width okay just to give you an idea there's 150 records in here okay we'll try one more in this case we're looking at a density function Okay, so we have density function here, and we're using this call center records here. That's the number of calls that the call center receives over an hour. And in this case, we get an outlier here on the count here, and we'll get a boundary range. Okay, so these are some of the outliers here. And we can see we have uh, zero values there. Okay, so we'll go into more detail about the outliers uh, in the next part of the of the presentation. But for just now, we can see how we can run our model. Okay, and then we can uh, look at uh, the category uh, prediction methods, logistic regression, SVM, and so on. Okay, so we'll uh, run this model here for our auto prediction. So in this case, we're going to predict the petal length based on all of our parameters. If we wanted, we could just focus on uh, one or two of the parameters. So we could try to train on that. Okay, so in this case, we're taking 30% uh, of the data set and then training to be able to train for our prediction for our petal length. And we can see here there is our prediction values uh, based on our training with sepal length and sepal width. Okay, we'll try one more. Uh, let's try for 
this one here for decision tree classifier. Okay, so we're trying to predict petal length here using the decision tree classifier. And you can see here that are the predictions for petal length based on all of the parameters. But uh, we could try again to just uh, classify the species. Okay, and so with this one, we can take uh, categories. So in this case, we have categories of the flowers, and we can we can actually use them to be able to train on uh, our data. So this has taken non-numeric and numeric values, and to be able to predict and there. So we can take species, and we can take sepal. Uh, uh, width and our decision tree classifier will train with with those two values even though the one value is a is a numeric value and the other one is a string then uh, the decision tree classifier is still able to make a prediction here for the numeric values the regression methods we don't use this type of uh, method. Okay, so we'll just try another one. Uh, let's try logistic regression here. Okay, so we'll run that. That's not the logistic regression. Let's try a random forest classifier. That one. Okay, so we have random forest classifier. So again, we could uh, try to train on species, which is a string, if you remember, and uh, sepal length. And we use the random forest classifier to train both on the string and for the numeric value. And we're trying to find petal length in this case. And that's it done there. Okay, so there's the actual value and there's the predicted value. We're using species and we're using sepal length. Okay, so that was the uh, category predictor. So we can use strings and numeric values. These are the numeric uh, methods to be able to predict a numerical value. That's linear regression, random forest regressor, lasso, and so on. Okay, so we'll try with this one uh, here. This one is auto prediction we can either use numeric or we could use category all that happens here is that we use numeric and it will call up random forest regress regressor uh, to, to perform this so in this case we can't use our uh, string values we use the numeric values from there okay so we're doing an auto predict on battery voltage And we're taking 70% of the data set to be able to train. Often we keep 30% back to be able to, to detect uh, whether we've been successful or not. So we're using all of the values here. So let's use uh, speed. 
and uh, engine speed and see if we can predict the battery voltage from them okay so it's numeric for battery voltage we're using speed and engine speed here and then these are predictions here so 14.02 and 13.937 is the actual value this is the predicted value here but if we were to use uh, the vehicle type here vehicle type vehicle type See it's struggling <laughs> uh, because this is a this is a numerical prediction. Okay, so so it doesn't work uh, because this is a numerical prediction method. So you can see here we've used. Yeah, thanks very much. Okay, so let's try another one. Uh, we we'll use elastic net here. Okay, and then we'll just select uh, some parameters here from our data set. So remember the star means all of them so we'll just do engine speed and speed and then we're predicting battery voltage here uh, based on the engine speed and speed of the car okay so so it just takes a little minute to be able to predict and there we go there's the battery predicted voltage and then there's the actual value and we're training on engine speed and also on speed to see what we get there okay so there's a number of other methods that we can use there uh, there's lasso uh, linear regression a random forest regressor and will we try this one here and the porous regressor so at this point we're not scoring any of the models so we can't really tell if they're good or not okay so again that's taken all of the values in the data set to be able to train but obviously we wouldn't include battery voltage as one of the parameters to train against so let's take uh, vertical G force in there and we'll train that vertical G force and we'll try to predict the battery voltage using random forest regressor. So let's to process that. And there we go. So it's using only vertical g-force, this value here, and it's trying to predict the voltage of the battery here, purely on that parameter. 
Okay, this one here, uh, system identification is a neural network uh, that we're creating. In this case, it has, uh, it has five, five layers, uh, an input layer, and then three hidden layers, and then an output layer. And we're using these three values as our inputs, and then we're trying to train the neural network on expenses. Okay, so we should be able to just, if we want to see the data set itself. Let's just look at the data set. Okay, so this is the uh, usage of uh, apps on uh, on a system. Uh, it's the number of accesses to each of the services within a network. Okay, over over time. So this is each day. This is how many calls there have been to each services expenses HR one HR two IT ops, and so on. And then we can then apply neural network where we take HR requests uh, for the two HR systems and the ERP requests and let's see if we can uh, uh, we can predict the number of requests to expenses the expenses service okay so as I said it's a five five layer three hidden three hidden layers in the neural network and we'll just run that. Okay, so the system identification uh, predictor has a neural network underneath. In this case, we're taking three, three input parameters for the three systems, HR1, HR2, and ERP, and then we're trying to train it to find out expenses. So here's the predicted here, 272. Oh, sorry, here, 190. And the actual number of uh, of accesses was 191, so it's pretty accurate there. 162 didn't do so well there. 140, 173, 189. Okay, so it's not a perfect uh, model, but uh, obviously we could we could expand that and find the best model uh, possible. Perhaps we're not picking the best. Uh, parameters to train on uh, here. Okay, so that's an example of a neural network uh, model. And then another thing we often do is to cluster. So the cluster would be, as I said, uh, malware. If something is definitely malware, that's one cluster. Not malware is another cluster. And something that's suspected might be another cluster. So we can cluster our data into a number of different clusters and make it easier to understand and to classify. So k-means, db-scan, birch spectral scanning are examples here. Okay, so let's take our first uh, data set here. We're going to create three different clusters for our, our petals, for our flowers, and we're going to use a uh, birch uh, here. So just, uh, just let's run that. See what we get. Okay, so as I said, three three clusters, three clusters here, and we're going to run this model and see what we get. Just takes a little minute to run it. Uh, clustering takes a little bit longer than some of the prediction models because it's got to move things around and try to find where our clusters are. So we'll see if we can find three clusters here. Once we get onto the visualization, we'll be able to see our clusters uh, easier. Okay, just uh, let me give this another name. Uh, I've already used that name for one of my models for something else. So I'll just uh, create something with a new name for my model. And there we are here. Okay, so we we'll, should be able to see there are three clusters, zero, two, and one. Okay, so each flower, uh, each data uh, point, 
element is getting matched to one of three uh, clusters in there. Okay, so that's using the, the birch method to do that. So we'll have a look at uh, k, k means. Quite a good mod, uh, model for clustering. You can see the birch method was, was quite slow the last time. So we'll see how well this one uh, runs. So again, we're clustering into three, uh, zero, one, and two for our flowers. And this time we're also getting a cluster distance, the distance that they are away from uh, each other is defined in here. But we should end up with our three main clusters for our data. Okay, there's one and there's two and there's uh, zero. Okay, so that's uh, clustering methods. And now what we need to do is we are prepare our data. So we might uh, extract the, some of the best fields uh, that are possible. Uh, so for that, we can use uh, a PCA to our field select. We can also reduce down the number of fields from say 20 features down to two or three, which would reduce the complexity. And for that, we use PCA and TFIDF. Okay, so field selector is a useful one that allows us to be able to take our features and find the best one for the, the, the thing we need to train for. So in this case, we're training for battery voltage and we have a short list of engine coolant temperature, engine speed, lateral g-force, longitudinal g-force and speed and we'll find that the engine coolant temperature is the best feature out of uh, those uh, parameters for us to actually uh, select. If we perhaps take uh, one out there and see how we get on now, we'll see, we, we should be able to now find the next best parameter for this and in this case it's longitudinal g-force is the best parameter out of these uh, four in there. So in this case we can we can find one value at a time which uh, has the most effect on our focus. Okay and we can also do it for a, a category a two so with category, in this case, because we're using the uh, track day database uh, data set, uh, a vehicle type is a category, which is the name of the, of the vehicle. So in this case, we're going to go for a categorical type, and we're going to find for a certain vehicle the best parameter to select for this. In this case, we've got a vehicle type, and we find that this lateral g-force is the best way to pick off the vehicle type. So there are a number of vehicles in, in here. So this trainer uh, is able to find out that uh, this parameter is the best for predicting that category of cars in this case. OK, and then we have a uh, hash vectorizer. <laughs> so hash vectorizer is good at spotting similar uh, words. So in this case, I've got a list of uh, passwords. And then what we do is that we look for n grams, which is a similarity between uh, words. So in this case, we're looking for a collision between uh, the tokenized values of our passwords. So we can see here is the passwords that I've got in the database. So we can see here there is a collision between this one and this one. They have a value of one and one uh, when compared to each other. 
so we have a match there. And then in this one, QWERTY123 uh, also has a match with this one here, but not with these, and then so on. So in this way, we can actually uh, determine uh, where we have similarity between uh, values. Okay, and we can do that, say, for 10 different uh, a, a analyses. And then we have uh, PCA and ICA. So in this case, what we have is a way to be able to reduce the complexity down into a number of uh, parameters. So this will merge parameters together to give us reduced complexity. So with ICA, I think in this case, we're choosing two components. And then we'll use these two components to be able to reduce down the complexity of the machine learning model. So rather than using all the fields in this case for our track day data, uh, if we want to train on battery voltage and engine speed, we can reduce it down into two components. And here are the components here. So in our machine learning model, we wouldn't need these components anymore. What we would train on is IC1 and IC2 uh, for, for that. And then we don't need all these other inputs for the actual model. So a very popular method is a PCA, so in kernel PCA. So in this case, we'll find three PCA components to train on. So we'll go ahead and we're training on a kernel PCA with a battery voltage and engine speed. And we want to have three three PCA components that we'll now uh, train on. So we can cluster on those or we can apply a machine learning model and we'll just see what we get for that now. It's going to train for us and there we go. So PCA1, PCA2 and there's the third one there. Okay, so as I said, we would take those PCA values and then train our machine learning model. So our data input would be to take all the data values and then convert it into PCA, one, two, three, and then use the PCA values to be able to train on, on that. Okay, so there's a few other ones that we can use. We could use PCA itself. Uh, the uh, NPR is another one. And TFI, TFIDF. Uh, is also uh, possible. In this case, we convert uh, the raw text into a matrix and then can train. Okay, so another thing that we will do before we feed our data in is to pre-process. So we could take large values and then compress them into values between minus one and one or zero and one. And then this way, all the values uh, have are normalized. So we can use robust scalar or a standard scalar here. So the first one that we have is uh, imputer. And in this case, we find values that are missing, which often happens in data sets and replace them either with an average value or a, a standard value. So in this case, I've taken uh, one value out of the data. And we'll see what it does. Oh, just let us type in the command instead. Okay, so fit imputer, and we'll go for battery voltage. Just 
Proof is in just now. Okay, so that is there. Uh, so there is no missing values. Uh, this is the replaced field here. So if I now put in missing, and I think I've taken one of the data set elements out, and we'll see what it does. So here we go. So I took this value out for the battery voltage for the very first record. And if we look over here, it's replaced it with uh, the average value of that data set value. So with this, you can actually replace it with a standard value or you can put replace missing values with uh, the average or medium uh, value. The robust scalar uh, will uh, scale our values between 0 and 1, so we'll just give that a try. So in this case we're going to, uh, we just need to put our, <laughs> our value back in there. Okay, so we're going to take a track day, and then we're going to fit our robust scalar value here and run that. Okay, so uh, because we're running it on all our data values, then they'll all be normalized uh, to uh, the range defined. Okay, so there we go. So we can see the value in here is, is a normalized value. and we uh, should be able to get them all within inside the uh, normalized uh, range. Or what we can do is we can just pick off uh, the, the values that we want to normalize from, from here, rather than picking all of the values. Okay, so the robust scalar is really there to make sure that uh, one value does not swamp other ones when we're using uh, typically a, a numeric processing value. Okay, so there's our RS speed. We can see there that the speed value has has been modified down into a smaller uh, range. The standard scalar uh, one. For our standard scalar, it's just the same, we can go for a standard scalar here. I'll we'll just do our star here. I'll have a look to see what the result is. So now what you can see is that uh, we've now normalized these values down. Okay, so often what we have to do is to be able to forecast in terms of time. So it might be for the number of logins at 9 o'clock uh, on a Monday morning and say 5 o'clock on a Friday uh, afternoon. So for that, we, you can use a Kalman filter or um, Arama. Okay, so uh, one of the, uh, the models we can have is state space forecast. So we'll just have a quick look at that one. Okay, so in this case, we're predicting for the access to uh, our C CRM system and also for our ERP system. So these are the predicted values. So 51 for CRM, uh, CRM 49. So it's not a bad uh, guess uh, here, but this is time-based. So it takes a time-based prediction. So a time-based that looks back 
uh, over time and see if there's any variations for seasonal or for daily activity. Uh, so it's a different type of model that we're applying. Hold back means that we hold the data back for 12 uh, predictions, which we can then use to be able to see uh, if our model is successful. OK, so uh, in this case, uh, that we these are the accesses to each of our uh, IT services, the number of accesses per day. And we're using the state space forecast to be able to predict these three values uh, based on uh, time and forecasting. In the next uh, presentation, we'll look at how we can visualize that better. And then we can use this model here, which is a fairly standard model uh, for our prediction. And uh, in this case, here's our, we're predicting for logins. And our prediction is is in is in here. Okay, so so and this allows us to be able to understand time uh, variations. Uh, so one thing that we'll look at is the scoring system for our our models. And there are various different scores that we can have depending on what our machine learning model is. For classification, uh, just like our IDS systems, we have accuracy, confusion matrix, F1 score, and so on, and the rock curve. In terms of regression, we can have mean absolute error, R2, R squared uh, score, mean squared error, and so on. So within each of the different uh, uh, models that we apply, we have different uh, uh, classifications for our scores. So let's see if we can create. OK, so for uh, scores, we can actually define the success of uh, each of the models that we apply. And each of them have, each of the model types have different types of scores, like classification has accuracy, the confusion matrix, F1, precision, uh, and, and so on. Uh, for uh, statistical, we might have uh, the Pearson uh, measure and Spearman. So each, each of our models has different types of scoring to be able to assess the success of our model or not. For basic classification, we have accuracy, the confusion matrix, F1 score, uh, the rock curve, and, and so on. And we'll look at those in more detail in the next uh, presentation. For things like regression scoring, we can have an R-squared method, a mean square, and so on. So when we apply our model, we can then score it. In this case, we're scoring it for the accuracy score. So let's have a look at that. Here we are here. OK, so we're reading our data. Uh, we'll just read all our data in. We're going to do a logistic regression on it to find the vehicle type and then we'll apply that as a model and then we'll see how accurate we are in terms of our, our predictions for the vehicle type based on battery voltage and engine coolant temperature and engine speed. So this uh, will show us hopefully the score, uh, the, the success rates uh, as a value between 0 and 1 
hopefully. So this is where we would get our score to be able to see how successful the model is. And there we are here. Okay, so uh, in terms of predicting the vehicle type, uh, using logis logistic regression, we only get a score of 0.522 uh, when we use battery voltage and engine coolant and engine speed. As we saw uh, before, uh, there was actually better predictors for that. Okay, so uh, we'll look at that in a bit more detail in the next uh, presentation and how we can score and look and uh, set up some experiments to, to understand the different methods. Okay, so that was a very basic introduction to Splunk and machine learning. Thank you.